Today, we have the privilege of having a guest speaker um, all the way from Kansas City, Missouri. It's funny, um, he texted me yesterday and said, hey, I need that address. And I texted him the address, and he texted me back and said, there's some mistake. Uh, it gave me a place in the middle of nowhere. And I said, that's it. You got the right place. God's doing amazing things in this place in the middle of nowhere. But um, no, um, God has given him a heart and a significant platform to reach the youth of this generation. Um, and so I'm just excited to hear what he has to say this morning. So let's please welcome the director of Awakening Team Camp of the International House of Prayer, Josh McDonald. Thank you. Okay, well, I'm going to just jump right in. <laughs> Hope I didn't offend anybody with the being in the middle of nowhere thing. <laughs> well, there's two things going on there. What I've learned is, is in small towns, people don't text the full address. I've learned that. I've learned that over the years when, you, when, I, when I'm traveling and I'm in some smaller towns. People won't, they won't, it'll be like 3427 Scott Street, Heartland. I'm like, hey, listen, can you send me the real address? You know? So he sent me a half address, but it was, it was right. And I'm like looking at the map, and I'm like, dude, this is on an intersection of Cornfield. Could you resend me the address? And no, here we are. But no, beautiful building, guys. This is so cool. So here's what I'm going to do. It's, it's, always, it's always challenging to come and be a guest speaker. Here's why. It's, I'm going to move this right out of the way so I have room to walk in. Um, it's a challenge because um, there's so many different emotions that people can feel uh, when a guest speaker is coming because I have no relational equity with you. I've got no history with you. I've got no, I mean, I know Dan a little bit. Um, I know Dan and his wife, uh, Danielle, right? I was going to say Donnell. Yeah, I just met Craig and his wife, but I know Dan a little bit just because, so Dan's brother-in-law, uh, Josh, is, is, a, is a friend of mine from the past named Josh Gillespie. He's like, had hey, Josh Gillespie here, right? So Josh and I used to do some, for about 10 years ago, we had a season together for about two years. Him and I were, he was, uh, he was kind of my, uh, I say this lightly, he was kind of my traveling assistant for a season. And Josh would go with me all over the nation and we would just do the craziest stuff. Signs and wonders and miracles everywhere we went. Amazing season. And out of that I met Dan. And so um, that's how we're here today. And so, but Dan I haven't talked in five years. And he reached out to me recently. And um, I was supposed to be in somewhere this week, and I can't remember where I was supposed to be, but it, it got canceled, and I said, bro, if there's a moment, it's now. And he said, all right, let's do it. And so I'm happy to be here. So here's what I'm going to do. So back to what I was saying about it, it, it's a unique tension being in my spot because I have no relational equity with you guys. And the pressure that I can feel is to bow to that. So the pressure that I can feel is to be safe, to build reports, but I don't have time for that. Uh, because who knows I'm going to come back. And I've got a lot of responsibilities where I live. And I, don't, I can't just come back four or five more times to then say something intense. <laughs> and so what happens is, is when I come into these settings, I, I can feel that pressure every time. You know, Lord, what do you want me to say? Because I, 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 I commit things to pastors loosely. I, I give them 70%. I say, I think I might talk on this. But I, I just don't put myself in that box because it takes, I can only think, feel, and pray so much, but it's until I actually get into the atmosphere, see the people, wander around during worship, pray in tongues, so if you're okay with praying in tongues, and I begin to go, okay, Lord, like, what am I supposed to say? And so I'm caught in between a couple of things today, but I think it's going to come out rightly. And at the end of the day, scientifically, you guys are only going to retain about two minutes of what I say today. God actually designed your human capacity to only be able to absorb about two minutes of what I'm going to say today. And so there's going to be two minute moments all throughout this message that's going to hit every person differently. And if you guys were at an interview after this service, you would find out everyone got something different, right? So I'm not even going to worry about trying to say it perfectly. I'm going to, I'm going to kind of share five minutes of my story and an attempt to get you to understand who I am, where I'm at, how I got here, 
And I'm going to weave a little bit into actually the assignment that's on my family in this season. But I also feel a little something for you guys too, all at the same time. And we're just going to see how it all comes out. And I'm going to honor the time well. And then we're going to pray for people today. Amen. All right. So my name is John. And uh, I originally am from Michigan. Okay. So I'm originally from Michigan. And third, so he, and I'm going to kind of share with you my testimony in a minute out of that. So I'm 33 years old now. Uh, my wife, Landry, and I are celebrating 12 years of marriage uh, next weekend. And this is my son, Nehemiah, right here. With your hand, Nim. We call him Nim for short. So Nehemiah is 11, and we have an 8-year-old daughter, Amaya. And so I have one of those stories. I was wilding out, did not like God or Jesus in my teenage years. That wound me up behind bars, blah, blah, blah. I was a drug addict, drug dealer. And that all came to an end when I was 17 years old. I had one of those wild stories, dropped out of high school, was just wilding out. And by a miracle from the Lord, I spent, I spent a season behind bars when I'm 17. And by a miracle from the Lord, when I'm 18 years old in 2008, I get court ordered to spend a year at a, you guys ever Teen Challenge? So it's like a Teen Challenge. <laughs> I didn't go to Teen Challenge, but it's a ministry kind of like a Teen Challenge. It's like a boarding school type thing. Um, up in the top of the state of Michigan, up in a city called Traverse City, Michigan. And um, I get sent there uh, August of 2008. I'm court-ordered to be there. And I grew up around the church a little bit. So the way my story goes is my parents got divorced when I was a little kid, and my dad got radically saved when I was 10. So kind of from 10, 11, 12, like my dad was this Jesus freak. At the time I was 13, I was like going to go do my own thing. So the seeds actually really were real. Um, I remember just my dad going from one way to the other, you know, and and so for that, for those couple of years, it was during, it was during the Y two K season. Does anyone remember that? And so, and so, you know, because of our poor theology and, and uh, just lack of biblical understanding, everybody was certain that the end times were coming, that we were going to get raptured at midnight. And uh, so it's funny because I grew up. My introduction to Jesus is kind of this end times conversation. And, uh, but I remember hitting 13 and kind of wanting to do my own thing. At that point, I'm hanging out with the wrong people. And I remember saying to myself, I think the Jesus thing is real. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get saved when I'm 95. No, literally, that was like, as a 13 or I was like, I'm going to party and drink and do what I want. And when I'm 95, I'll get saved. Because I don't think I'm going to die in a car accident. Like the likes of me dying prematurely ain't going to happen. I'm going to live my life. Because, because... I did not, growing up, I did not grow up in a spirit-filled environment. And what I mean by that is not tongues and snakes and charismatic stuff. Sorry, if you don't know what I'm talking about the snakes. Just, we don't do that. We don't do that where I'm from, but it's, this is a joke. Just let that one roll right off you. Don't, if you don't know what I'm talking about, there, 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 there's, some, there's some goofballs out there that take the verse literal that, that if, we, if a snake touches us, it won't harm us, and they think that it's a faith act to hold snakes and... <laughs> I throw that one out there as a joke, but we're not about the snake. But when I say a spiritual environment, what I don't mean is charismatic stuff. Actually, what I mean is there's a vibrant life of fire on the inside. That when you know, I wasn't around Christians that talked about Jesus like he was real. It was a lot of church. It was a lot of religion. It was a lot of emotions. And so I didn't have the connection that, you know, Jesus is better. I didn't have the connection that he's beautiful and that if I taste and see him, my desires change. That when I give my life to Jesus, all of a sudden I take on a new nature and my desires begin to change. So I thought getting saved meant I couldn't have fun anymore. <laughs> but I just knowing that there's people out there that have some sort of moment with God that makes them want to do that, but I don't see it, you know. So that, that, was, that was my journey. And so I get, the long story short, I get sent to this spirit-filled Christian rehab boarding school place. And they introduced me to a whole different kind of version of Jesus. They were radically on fire, full of the Holy Spirit. Just got to see a different version of Jesus. And I remember being 18, laying in my bunk, thinking to myself, man, these people here talk about Jesus as if they had coffee with him yesterday. It wasn't just some amens and hallelujahs and religious rhetoric of quoting verses and stuff. These guys had living, breathing relationships with God, and they had something to say, and they were consistently in a relational dialogue with him that every day there was something new that God was saying and doing. And I remember it just messing with my head. And not to mention, these people up in the, at this rehab that I got saved at, 
They also were obsessed with these people in Kansas City who pray 24-7. Has anyone not heard of it? This is not to be like, what the heck? But has anyone here not heard of the International House of Prayer in Kansas City? Let's be honest. Raise your hand. Is there anyone here that's like, if you guys have all, nod your heads with me, you, you guys have heard of the International House of Prayer. Okay. If you haven't, it's all good. Long story short, we're a weird group of people in Kansas City that occupationally do 24-7 prayer. Literally. Like the Tabernacle of David. So, for 23 years, we've been a never-ending worship and prayer set in IHOP in Kansas City. We've got 30 worship teams that rotate around the clock every two hours. We have 500 people on full-time staff that raise their own missionary support to be there. And we are actually all what we call intercessory missionaries. We've all got amazing assignments, and I lead a team camp of 600 teenagers every summer. But we all have our unique ministries and assignments, but none of us move to Kansas City to do Awakening Team Camp, or to do the homeless ministry, or to do the missions to Africa. We all had an encounter with God from different places all over the nation where we heard about these people in Kansas City that were praying night and day. And so we all have this unique thing in common where we give 20 plus hours of our week to doing the house of prayer. Like we are occupational intercessory missionaries. And it's broken up into time slots. Do the morning section, afternoon section, evening section, and then the midnight to 6 a.m. night watch. And so, I've had the, and so, long story short, these people at this rehab, they're obsessed with these guys in Kansas City who pray night and day. And so I'm getting kind of indoctrinated in this whole movement that's happening in Kansas City. And, you know, they would make us watch these teachings. And I would just watch these guys and go, I never really even like these people. The things that they say, the stuff that they talk about. I mean, what kind of people leave careers to raise money to sit at Jesus' feet for 20 plus hours a week. You know, like, these are different kind of people, you know? So I end up having my own encounter with Jesus on November 11, 2008, and I get saved and delivered. I get saved, I get delivered, and actually, what happened was, my story is unique, I had an encounter with the Lord not in the way you would think. For four months, the Lord was chipping at my heart. I got removed from my lifestyle and thrown into this controlled environment right, where you can't do nothing. I mean, there was a girls' program and a guys' program, but they kept us separate, and if we even looked across the field, you, you got you put on quiet time. They, all, they had all these tactics to destroy your pride. Like, you literally have to wear a sticker on your chest that said, I'm on quiet time for 20 minutes. And every time you made a, a fuss about it, 25, 30, and if you push it too far, you'll get put down to another phase, and you stay in the program longer, and the whole thing. And, and so I get, so what happens with me is, for four months, the Lord's chipping at my heart. So, because I got put into this controlled environment, full of the Holy Spirit, with no outside influence, no secular music, no movies, no people. So it's Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And so, for four months, day by day, the Lord is just softening my heart. And there's all these crazy stories I don't have time to share. But on November 11, 2008, I was sitting in our chapel service. I could take you to the seat where it happened at 10 o'clock in the morning. And I just had this knowing it's time to stop resisting. At this point, I'm missing out on something. Because I'm watching these guys that I made packs with. We ain't going to say, bro. You and I, you know, like, every dude that I made a pact with got saved. And I'm like, you guys are pumped. Like, what the heck? We ain't doing that thing, you know? And I'm the last man standing, right? And so that day, on November 11th, that evening, I, I kind of meet with this guy named Dan Rich. And I'm like, you don't know this, you know? And we do it the thing, you know, I, I give my life to Jesus. And I didn't have an angel come visit me, nothing like that, but here's what happens. The next day, I wake up, and I'm in a conversation with some guys, and we start talking inappropriate about something, like we do. And it felt wrong. And it felt wrong, and it stripped me out. Like, the fact that I even felt wrong about something was enough, <laughs> like, I was, I was really bad, guys, when I was a teenager. If I knew that your grandma was on a cruise, I would throw a brick through a window, steal her jewelry, take her to the pawn shop. I'll steal from my best friend. I'll steal from my mom. I'll steal from your mom. I'll steal from your grandma. I'll rip off your girlfriend. I was a ruthless. I was really, really ruthless. Like, I was so selfish. And so for me to feel wrong about something was insane, you know. And then 40 days, 45 days later, on December 27th, Okay, so I get saved November 11th, 2008. November 27th, they come into my room at 4 o'clock in the morning. When I say they, some of the, some of the leaders of the ministry, and they go, guys, you have a couple hours to pack. We're headed to Kansas City. So they, and then they, they drive a van of us guys 
to this annual conference called the One Thing Conference that I have KC used to put on. We don't do it anymore, but we do this massive conference at, during uh, New Year's, kind of 28th through the 1st. Uh, literally 20,000 people from all over the world have come to it at the convention center downtown Kansas City. And here I am, 45 days saved. I don't got much Bible knowledge. I don't got much going on for me. Uh, some of some of you, uh, some of you farm guys in here, crack up about this one a little bit. I had some very unhealthy, uh, toxic kind of masculinity from being a jock growing up. So I thought men that were expressive and worth it struggled with their with their. Uh, you get the point. Literally, that's what I thought. So I'm in this. I'm in this crowd of 20,000 people. I'm all in for Jesus. judging them. But the whole time, the Lord doing something in my heart, and I'll never forget Mike Bickle, who's now never could have thought, you know, 14 years later that this man would be who he is in my life today and a spiritual dad to me. But Mike Bickle stands up on the stage that night and goes, no. Like, this is not what you do at a young adult conference. Like, here's this guy who's got, you know, 15,000 young adults in his auditorium. You're going to try to preach a relatable message, you know. He gets up there and goes nuts about, and he starts using this language, God is raising up end time forerunner messengers. You ever heard that phrase before? God is raising up end time forerunner messengers who are going to live their lives like John the Baptist. And he goes off and he preaches this message about God raising up a generation that will get lost in the desert of fasting and prayer for real. They will actually, occupationally, give their lives to fasting and prayer to prepare a generation for the coming of the Lord. And, and he's just going off. God's marking you in this day and blah, 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 blah. And I don't know what he's saying. I mean, I'm an 18-year-old who just got saved. But what I discovered from that day that I'll never forget, that's become, a, that's become such a deep life thing in me, is I realized something in that, in that moment. As a, as a brand new 18 year old believer, I got marked that night, point being, and I, I responded, so I'm going to give my life to this. And here I am, 14 years later. We have been in full time occupational intercessor missionaries for 13 years, giving our lives to fasting and prayer, for real, for real. I said yes that night, and, 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 it, and it really hit my life. We have been fully funded missionaries, raising our own support as a family for 13 years. Lived in New York City in the middle of that for a couple of years. And it has just been a wild ride. But I learned something that night. We try to reach people at the flesh level. We try to reach people at a flesh level, at a mind level. And we try so hard to minister to the needs of people that we never hit a fire on the inside that when we speak, it goes right past your flesh. It goes right past your intellect. It goes right past your struggle that you've not been able to overcome for a decade because you're consistently being fed things of the mind. And we come to church to get something because we don't have something Monday through Saturday. We don't, we're not being taught how to actually thrive in the Spirit Monday through Saturday at 6 o'clock in the morning before you go to work. And so we... We get beat up all week long to then come to church on Sunday to get fed so that we can be strong for the week. That is the most defeated, milk-drinking Christianity that you could ever experience. You will stay bound in your junk forever if you live that way. And I realized as an 18-year-old, the Lord downloaded to me that even though here I am, 18 years old, 40 days saved, judging guys who are worshiping passionately, Yet Mike Bickle gets on a stage, and he's been cultivating something for 30, 40 years. And he gets on a stage, and he calls a generation to get lost in the woods and fast and pray. And here I am as a 40-day-old Christian, still struggling with all my junk. But Mike's beat hit a beat that God placed in me. And I don't care if you're 5 years old or 75 years old, if you are a Christian in this room, you have been placed within you the deep of God. You have been given the Holy Spirit. Not, sorry, actually I hate saying that. Not the Holy Spirit. You've been given Holy Spirit. You guys know when you get saved, it's not your soul that gets saved. You understand that, right? We say that's a charismatic thing we say. We're going after souls. And that's fine. We need to correct that. The point is we're going after people. But that's what they mean. It's not your, it's not your soul that gets saved. It's not your body that gets saved. That's why this hurts. 
Now God can step in and supernaturally heal. I, your boy God Gillespie, him and I have seen some healing. I, he can do that. But it's, but it's not our body that's in faith. I don't care how supernaturally you believe, you're going to get old and not function well at 95. It just ain't going to work that way. You, from the day you get born, are on your way to death. And it only gets worse. Now, does that not mean we believe for supernatural health and healing and walking all the Absolutely. I believe you can be 80 years old and very functioning, very healthy, very active. But it's our spirit that gets saved. It's our spirit that gets saved. Your spirit that was once dead becomes alive in Jesus. And now you have a bank account with billions and billions and billions of dollars living on the inside of you. But you still live on food stamps every single day. Over and over and over again. You've got a debit card called the Holy Spirit. And that Holy Spirit is the divine bank account to the eternal riches of God. Jesus said in John 16, Holy Spirit will take the deep things that are in God and declare them to you. The things that are impossible for you to receive in the mind, the things that are impossible for you to, to, to receive in your intellect, Holy Spirit became the gift of God, the very nature of God inside of you, and it's through that that you access heaven's resources. I'm not even talking about money. I'm talking about heaven's resources in the form of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of God that actually gives you the power to overcome. But we don't know how to live this life of the deep, and we don't got a lot of people talking to our deep. We don't got a lot of people talking to our deep. And we don't got a lot of people that are paying prices in the secret and no one's looking. Do you know what a miracle it is that God would entrust humans to be able to communicate the word of the Lord? And then he actually comes through my idiot, stupid brain and speaks through me to touch your spirit to actually provide supernatural transformation. That is wild. But what it doesn't come is, is cheap. Salvation comes freely. The gift of righteousness comes freely. But your life of victory, your life of fruitfulness, your life of maturity that then plays into a life that can actually provide breakthrough for others doesn't come cheap. It's a lifestyle. And I'll never forget that day as an 18-year-old where I realized I didn't know what the heck he was talking about when Mike preached that message. But his deep hit something at a 40-day saved 18-year-old deep that provoked me to say, I don't know what he just said, but I'm in. And I, and I didn't even go to the altar call. People were running to the altar. Mike gave a very significant extreme altar call that night. He said, I'm calling people to the front tonight. He gave this really intense prophetic word. He goes, I believe the Lord showed me there's 1,000 of you in the room tonight. You're going to get marked with a forerunner spirit to such a degree that you're going to leave everything. You're going to quit your job. You're going to leave everything. And you're going to give your life to God. And so the Lord's going to make it work for you. Well, practically, though. No, no, for real, practically. <laughs> you know? And I didn't even go up to the altar. But I'm standing there. I'm kind of brand new Christian. It's in the book. And I'm getting a divine message. And I, and I just said, under my breath, they didn't say it out loud. I said, in my head, I said to the Lord, whatever that means, I'll give my life to it. And eight months later, brand new Christian, less than a year saved, I moved to Kansas City with 200 bucks a month in support committed from my dad to pay for a room at someone's house. I had no money, no nothing. And 14 years later, here we are. And it has been an unbelievable journey of ups and downs, twists and turns, super hard seasons. Almost lost our marriage twice um, because I had to learn. I was a knucklehead. And um, I have one of those unique stories where I got marked and then really marked again at 21 and got a lot of favor and a lot of platform at a very young age with no way to know how to do it. It almost ruined the thing. When I was 23 years old, I was traveling 30 years in Nigeria because that's what my heroes did. I didn't have I didn't have fathers and mothers sitting me down and being like, this isn't it. 
and it almost cost us, you know. And the Lord tricked us and moved us to New York City, and we thought we were there for revival and said he was there to crush us. And so, so we had a very hard two years in New York City. Not hard in the, like, actually financially, we were very blessed. It was more like we would swim through a lot, and it challenged our family. The Lord slingshotted my family back to Kansas City five and a half years ago, and we've been on this journey of unlearning everything that I thought meant success in ministry. And Mike Dickel's teachings on the First Commandment had uh, yet to take root in my heart when I was a young 20-year-old who wanted to see revival. I still want to see revival. But we've been on this five-year journey. The Lord has just stepped in. And my family is the healthiest it's ever been. My wife and I are thriving and on fire. And it's just been this um, unbelievable season. And in the last three months, there's been a two-year-long God story. I'll share one of those stories with you. Again, I'm just going to kind of share my story and weave in and out of Revelation as I go, of just things that I've been looking for. And I'm believing that there's even stuff I already said that some of you guys are feeling it right now. But I had, so long story short, um, almost two years ago, so April 9th, 2021. Do you guys believe in prophetic and charismatic stuff? Do you guys still believe God speaks to you in dreams? Okay, okay, good. <laughs> I'm in the right company, people, then. Sometimes, hey, no, you'd be shocked with ministries. I do think it's to that. Don't believe this stuff. And I have to deny it. Um, I had a dream on April 9th, 2021, that uh, changed the course of my family's life that we didn't expect would. Um, so, so, you get it. We're in February. So, basically, 22 months ago, um, I have this dream. And in the dream, I'm with a friend named Corey Russell, who's a kind of spiritual guide in my life. And, um, me and Corey are in this dream. We're in Hawaii. Come on now. I don't know why we're in Hawaii, but in the dream, we were in Hawaii for some reason, and we're in my car. And the Spirit of the Lord falls in my car, and we go into agonizing, bone crushing, woman giving birth intercession. Like groaning intercession, if you don't see it. I've actually never experienced it in your life, but I've had it happen to me in dreams. Um, there's biblical presidents that we see in first time that, you know, Hannah's in anguish. Hannah was in so much anguish over being barren that when she prayed, nothing even came out of her mouth. They thought she was drunk. And they were like, what is wrong with you? And that, that level of deep, there was, there was a deep without words. And that deep birthed a Samuel who identified David, who were many of the Jesus. You know, we don't know. We don't know. But, you know, when we get hit, God wants to deposit burdens that don't have any on the inside of us. So I had this dream. We're in deep, we're in this deep place of prayer. And in the dream, Corey, my buddy Corey cries out, goes, Lord, just as you're marking us with Isaiah 61, he goes, I ask that you would do it in the whole generation. And then in the dream, I have the most bizarre thing happen. It's like I see a vision within a dream. Weird. I'm asleep having a dream, and in the dream, I'm having a vision. And I see in front of me, when Corey prays that prayer, Lord, just as you're marking us with Isaiah 61, which Isaiah 61 is what Jesus quotes in part in Luke 14, when he says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, so he's going to make me speak to you. Know Isaiah 61, theologically, just so you know, is a very interesting uh, pop, uh, a passage of the chapter, because the first four verses were fulfilled, the rest have yet to be fulfilled. So it's actually an Israel-centric end-time prophecy, but the first four verses were fulfilled in this way. You know, it's like Jesus who stands in the synagogue and says, "Today, day, this has been fulfilled. But Jesus didn't quote the whole rest of the chapter. You know, they shall be called oaks of righteousness when you want. So Corey cries that out, and I have this thing happen. Three bullet points come across the screen, like, like, like in front of my face on the screen. Israel, Gen Z, signs and wonders. Years day, and I wake up in the dream. And I have this knowing. I, I wake up in the dream. And right when I wake up, I didn't hear the Lord say it. Um, I, 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 you know, there's a life that we live where we learn how to partner with from what, what is within. Some of you guys, this is just a little pastoral note. You sit and strive to hear God when He's trying to speak from within. Because he gave us his spirit. Doesn't mean we don't have moments where the voice of the Lord speaks, but he gave us his spirit. And so we have to learn how to fellowship and actually talk to the spirit. That's another piece of my time. 
But I have this internal knowing. I wake up in that half awake, half asleep spot. I'm like, wow, that dream is crazy. And I feel like I hear the Lord say to me, I'm going to solve the new Mark James in this hour. And they're going to have an understanding of the story that's bigger than that. They're going to get caught and lost in God's story. That's what happened to me when I was in the So I come out. And uh, I, come out, I come out into the living room. I'm just sitting there thinking about it. And then my son comes out. So my son comes out. And he goes, Dad, I had a crazy dream last night. My son was going to do it. And I'm like, really? I'm like, so did I. And he goes, Dad, in my dream, I'm walking through a field with Jesus. And all of a sudden, all of these demons, and was it dragons or was it demons? You don't remember? Uh, he said, which one was it? Was it dragons or demons? Do you remember? So he says, um, he says something like that. They start coming at him, and Jesus takes my son, and he hides him, like, behind a hill. But he has this knowing in the dream that it would be like a pavilion. And Jesus goes and fights these demons, and right before he wakes up, the voice of the Lord speaks to my son in the dream, Psalm 27. That's what Maybe he has before, but in Psalm 27, it literally says, He will hide you under his pavilion in the day of trouble. I'm just sitting on the couch going, This is wild. You know, and so what do you do with dreams like that? That's a good dream, put on the cell. Or you lean in and you respond. Now, what do you do? You go start the same ministry? No, that's where people mess up. They take one prophetic word and they go start a ministry. God actually wants to impregnate you with something. You can actually give birth to it, not just go adopt it. All day. By the way, we're all about the spirit of adoption. <laughs> My in laws lead a very large ministry that is they're giving their life to being people to adopt. So that wasn't a gift adoption, but in the spirit, we get things that become a very small seed, and we don't let the process of the birthing happen through fasting and prayer, and so we just go adopt them. Or we have premature birth. And so I'm like, what do we do with the screen? So I just so happened to lead our Wednesday at 10 a.m. set anyways, and I I prayer to lead it. And I'm like, I go, so I go to the meeting, uh, our briefing before that set, and I just said, guys, I had this dream. I said, we need to lay a hold of Gen Z and pray. That's what we're going to do. We're going to turn this set into a Gen Z set. We're going to cry out for middle schoolers, high schoolers, and college students. And so that was in April of 2021. So April, May, June, July, August, right? You're sipping away. So two, four, six, eight, basically eight hours a month, you know, of, of every week, two hours a week, just giving ourselves praying. And a movement starts happening without a time. A movement starts happening where all of a sudden, like, people are watching, people are connecting. I, one of the, the, the I, I find out that over a thousand people are tuning in online on the live stream to watch it. And I'm like, oh, this is really crazy. Like, yeah, this is abnormal. Something's going on. And then parents are starting to pull their kids out of school to come be in the prayer set on Wednesday. And then our Bible, we have a Bible school I have a couple hundred students, and that's all Gen Z, 18, 19, 20, 20, 20, They all start owning it. And before we know it, we've got a little movement happening. And we're like, man, this is really something. Well, then September of that year rolls around, and long story short, there's another deposit. There, there, there's a conference that happened to Kansas City for Next Gen Leaders, um, and Something hit my family's heart, and it was just like, it kind of like the next level of installment. So all we took a dream from April, and we just started to pray, 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 pray. So April, May, June, July, August, September. So six months later, another deposit happens at this conference, and I won't explain how, but it did. And we leave that conference, and me and my friend Daniel, we go, all right, here's what we're going to do. I said, bro, we're over here crying out for millions of Gen Zers across the world. If it, if it doesn't break in in our own homes, then our kids' lives, then what is it? And so him and I, we, the Lord didn't tell us to do this. We just were responding. I was like, we're going to fast for the next 10 days on water. And we're going to get to a side room. In our, in our prayer room, we have these side rooms in Kansas City. I'm like, we're going we're to contend for our kids. So every day, for 10 days, we're like having these little 20-minute side room prayer meetings, praying for our kids by name. And it's a week fast. Like, I'm struggling. In day five, I broke it. Like, I end up eating on day five, you know, like. My friend has a warning dream that we shouldn't break the fast, and I break it anyways. Like, you know, this is one of those fasts, but we tried. And uh, on day 10 of the fast, we're having a Bible study in my living room on, on, and with my kids. And we try to do these week Bible studies like once a week, you know, 20 minutes, or whatever. 
and then we're in this we're in this conversation with those kids about righteousness. You know, what is righteousness? You can't be born righteous. You know, we're we're navigating the. They grew up in a Christian home. They in this wild ministry life, and so if, they're, if we're not careful, because we live in, a, in our neighborhood, luckily they get to play with unbelievers, and so they can be that tension of like we're good, they're bad. <laughs> so we're so we're so we're talking to these kids, our kids about righteousness, and the fear of the Lord falls on my son. I didn't know it. It's never happened before. And he begins to weep under the presence of God and gives his life to Jesus in my name on day ten of our fast. Obviously, as a dad, it's the greatest thing that ever happened. But I realized more than just, oh my, I mean, I'm still, like, to, to this day, I still have to remember that that happened. I'm like, oh my God, that happened. But I realized in that moment that we were carrying a sincere level of authority. That a 10 day fast would provide an encounter in my living room. For a you know? And. So that turns into seven more prophetic things that happened from that, from then till this last fall, which led us to a very significant prophetic storyline that led us to now. We have completely put our whole life to the next generation. And so we are now leading what's called the Awakening Team Camp um, in Kansas City. And we've got about 600 teenagers that come every summer for three different camps. So the junior high camp for eight days, and then it's a high school worship camp for eight days. And we're actually training up. 13, 14, 15 year old singers in existence who are leading their own faith. So actually, we do that again too. My son, he's on a, they, we have our own prayer room that our kids pull on me. It's all, the whole worship team is 12 and 13 year olds. And I think it's, how many days a week is it, bud? Yeah, it's like two or three days a week, whatever, four or five hours a day of worship and prayer. And um, it's just been a wild story. But, I, but I, if we would not have stayed faithful, to following the nuggets. It's kind of like giving you guys a story. I was listening to it this morning. You know, who would have thought 20 years ago Dan is sitting in the congregation while an evangelist is in town giving a prophetic word to Craig that you guys are going to have build your own building one day while he's having an encounter with the Lord but he's getting marked to be in full-time ministry. Okay? But the, the, the beauty of the Lord's prophetic storyline is who would have thought and it would end like this. That he would end up pastoring when they get the fulfillment of that prophetic word all at the same time. But what you don't know about Dan's life is I, I don't even know either. I'm just saying this. <laughs> Hope it's accurate, bro. What you don't know about Dan's life is I bet you he's made about 500 decisions when nobody was looking to steward that prophetic word. He fasted when no one was looking. He prayed when no one was looking. He forgave people that really screwed him over when nobody was looking. Blah, 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 blah. He had to mine that goal. And that probably wasn't his only prophetic word. He stayed faithful to that word. And I bet something else happened six months later. And I bet if you study your storyline, the Lord gave you a nugget along the way. And that is how he leads us. We want the Lord to just, we want to be lazy. We want to sit in our recliner in our living room and, God, I'm right here. You see me. If you want to tell me what to do with my life, I'll do it. No, he goes, He goes. hey, actually, remember that time that guy needed that word and you felt a little tingly in your stomach? You did nothing with it? Go back to that one. And God, you pray for three months and then I'm going to give you a dream. See, it's a big, gigantic treasure hunt. And I'm not saying this out of pride, but if you go through my iPad or my notes in my iPhone, I'm a fanatic about the prophetic and dreams, I can go into my stuff, I can type in the word Dallas, and every prophetic word or dream I've ever had about Dallas will show up in the last 10 years, and I can just study it. So when the leadership of IHOP KC comes to me in September and says, hey, the Lord puts you on our heart, blah, 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 would you consider taking over the Awakening Team Camp? I wasn't just another kid saying yes to another assignment working my way up the chain. I, I got to go back to my iPad, and I got to... It didn't take more than an hour to look at 12 dots of the last two years of, oh my gosh, then we did the fast, and then this, and it's like, I'm in, because I stewarded a storyline with the Lord. And, and a lot of us, and, and here's the word I want to give you. Six minutes and 20, okay, here we go. So I'm going to end with this. I'm going to end with this. Here's the word that I have for you guys. Hosea 10, verse 12. 
This is not a correction. This is an encouragement to get out of your comfort and to take your stand in this season and go to the next level. Jose is in there somewhere. After Ezekiel, I think. I'm trying to find it. Here we go. After Daniel. Verse, chapter 10, verse 12. Some of you guys that are maybe... Sorry, I hope I'm not stereotyping. Is there any farmers in here? Anyone in the farm industry? A couple of you guys? All right, some of you guys might understand this then. Verse 12. We're going to go down halfway into it. Break off your fallow ground, for it is the time to seek the Lord, that He may come and rain righteousness upon you. So, I had the privilege as well in Kansas City to be a, a, just a mentor and a coach in our Bible school. So long story short, in our Bible school, I've got 20 college students, the 20 of our Bible school students that literally do life with my family. They come to the prayer room with me Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays for four hours. I meet with them in the side room for an hour. We just pray in tongues on Mondays for a straight hour. We <laughs> just pray in tongues together. And then on Wednesdays, we, it's so much fun. And then I get to take them down to a college campus every Wednesday night and teach them how to share their faith. Um, there's a whole reason why we do that, but blah, blah, blah. But um, on Friday, we got this wild new kid. He's a freshman. He's a little older. He's 26. But we got this wild freshman named Josh Curtis who just joined our team. He just moved here from Sacramento. The Lord, he's been in the house of prayer for six years, leading the house of prayer, and the Lord told him to stop and have a season of learning. And so it's kind of humble of him, you know. So this 26-year-old kid just moved to Kansas City to a Bible school, and he gives me this word for you guys. And I don't, and here's the thing. You know, he literally gave me a word. So I mentioned, I'm going to this church in Iowa this weekend, and he said, that's crazy. And I don't, so when I get prophetic words from people, I actually do self them. What I mean by that is I write them down, I'm faithful to them, but I don't make decisions about my life because someone tells me the word for me. I probably get 12 a week. Cindy Bill Hansen from South Carolina had the word of the Lord for me. You know, like, <laughs> just like, thank you for the message, you know, and, I, and, and I'm not trying to be cynical, but I've got my own real intense history with God. I, I have my own history in God. And so the prophetic words that people give me line up with my own stuff. Now, sometimes a prophetic word comes out of the blue. You didn't see it coming. It's way out in left field, but you feel the resignation on the inside. You're like, I'm going to look into this one. But I never just go make a decision. The Lord says you're going to New York. All right, Pastor New is going to New York. Like, no. So I don't typically, like, I don't typically, like, okay, this guy gives me a word for you guys. I'm like, cool. It was more so, like, how the Lord was going to use me. I was not necessarily a word for you guys. But when I stepped into the room today, I just felt a pivot. I was really going to go heavy on God's heart for the next generation in Gen Z. I'm sorry, Josh, I didn't quite go there. I got sorry, Dan. I didn't quite go there. I was really going to hit heavy on Malachi 4 6 and how the Lord's turning his heart for the next generation. And he is. So get in the river. Fathers and mothers in the room, the promise of Malachi 4 is that you turn your hearts first. There's that message. You turn your hearts first then they turn their hearts to you. But it's not respect your elders, so that's a very extreme biblical conversation. And I would have that one with the teenagers because actually the Lord connects disobedience to parents as well as the adult in the Old Testament. It's, it's, it's as intense as setting up any surprise. Anyway. So I don't, want any, I don't want anyone in the room at 60 and above go, well, they need their respect for us. You know, I agree. But, but if you hold on to that and then side-eye the next generation... I'm telling you right now, you are not operating in God's heart pattern. He says that in the last days, he says, uh, fathers and mothers, Malachi 4, 6, will turn their hearts to the children, and then in response, the hearts of the children turn their hearts to the fathers. Why? So you can feel honored and respected at zero for that. It's because when we turn our hearts next generation, we represent the father, the father, to them, but then they turn their hearts to us because we're a representation to them of the authenticity of the Father. That's my message on Malachi 4, 6. Let's pray for the next gen. But I have a word for you guys, and I'm going to close it out right here. Brett, so I'm back there pacing during worship, and I just thought the Lord said, remind me of this word. Break up your fallow ground, for it is the time to seek the Lord that He may come and rain righteousness on you. Sometimes we find ourselves going through the motions of Christianity. Some for a short season, some for 30, 40 years. We don't even know why we do what we do. 
Why do we come here and sing a song? Why do we sing a song, then do an announcement, then, then sing three more, then close? Why do we do that? Why? I'm not, not, not challenging what you're doing. I'm just saying, do you ever think that way, though? Do you ever challenge what you're doing? Because what happens is, is our ground grows, goes fallow. And we just, I'm a Christian. I vote Republican. And it's just like, and it's like that we associate, like, Almost, and, and, and unfortunately, because of the, the, the ridiculousness of 2020, and what I mean by that is the ridiculousness of how the church responded to 2020. What I don't mean is what Biden said and what Trump said. What I mean is how the church responded. It proved how immature we really were. That we made it about math. You got pastors losing their congregations because they weren't strong enough on a political affiliation. Or vice versa, they were too strong on a political affiliation. Either way, pastors all got trapped, and what it, what it exposed is how immature the church is. That people would leave a church because we're just trying to, like, love people. Hey, if you are fearful of getting COVID and, and need to wear a mask, like, okay. Like, we're not going to, like, Oh, don't, don't claim they've got a spirit of fear. That, why do you put a seatbelt on when you drive every day? Why do you carry a gun with you every day? You're going to rebuke somebody because they don't want to get sick because people really have died. But you carry a gun to shoot somebody if your life feels threatened. I'm just going to say it like it is. I, I'm all about gun rights. I'm all about being able to carry a gun. I think it's a great thing to be able to do. But let's just be honest. Why I go there? Help me, help me come back, Lord. Help me come back. Help me come back. Help me come back. Oh, oh. What I was saying is, is, is in 2020 we realized, like now, what's so sad is that the world that's not saved, you know, that are way out there, the transgender dudes that I spent time with this morning at Starbucks in downtown Des Moines, fill in the blank. Literally, America, Republican, Donald Trump, Christian, they're all in the same category. Literally, when the world thinks about a Christian, they think about right-wing politics. So that, that's actually like where we're at in America. No, it's what he's saying. And so the Lord... Is, and this isn't like a, a, a to you guys only. I just am feeling this stirring in my heart when he's going, I want to break up the fallow ground. Ground that has just been laying dormant. The seed, you are the garden, you are the ground. And sometimes we just do church and we just do the thing. And we, if you're really on fire, you give 10% of your income. But we know what the stats say about that. <laughs> and, and, and we just are doing the motions of Christianity. But if you're to really peel back the layers of religiosity, are you on fire for real? And what I don't mean is this. Or passionate contemporary, or, uh, contemporary worship. That could be religious within itself. I find that charismatics are more religious than none. Dude, it's the hardcore reform guys that are like living in agony that they're never doing enough. I'd almost rather be like that, where I'm in a constant awareness of the holiness of God and I'm not worthy, than like I'm righteous and charismatic and I got this badge called tongues and you're lukewarm and we're not. Listen, Revelation 3 makes it super clear, by the way, what lukewarm Christianity is, and it's not Baptist singing, singing hymns. I know some Baptist dudes singing hymns that hearts are real tender. And I know some charismatics who cast out demons who are absolute jerks. For real. Revelation 3, Jesus makes it super clear what lukewarm Christianity is. It's not what everyone defines it as. It's very clear. People go, oh, it just means you're not fully on fire. You're in the between. God doesn't like that. No, that's not what it means. Jesus says, I have this just to the church of, uh, I think it's uh, Laodicea. He goes, I have this thing against you. You're not cold or hot. You're lukewarm. But he didn't just read it there. He defines what it means. He goes, you're lukewarm 
because you think you're all good and have need of nothing. He's not talking about unbelievers. He's not talking about, you know, he's talking about religious pride that thinks they've got it figured out. And he's going, no, you're actually blind, naked, miserable. That's the definition. So if you got all the spiritual gifts in this room, but your heart is offended at your brother, the Lord says he doesn't even take that place as often Like, you actually couldn't even come up to him and put a check in the place if you've got issues or something. The Bible says that. This is what it means to be on the place. That you've got enough of a tender flame on the inside that you're going to forgive Jack. I hope there's no Jack in here, you know. <laughs> it might be a Jack. You know, I've, you could, I've done, that wasn't pathetic at all. But I'm just making an idea. Does this make sense? And we, and so, but in America, it's really easy. You know, you go to church, you see the check the box, I did it. You maybe give a little bit of your resources. Um, you know, you, you, you try your best to watch you know, the Hallmark Channel instead of MTV. I don't know, you know. You go to the shows then instead of that movie, you know, whatever it might be. And you kind of do all the religious things, but if you were to peel back the layers, so you really have it. Like you're like you actually have not watered your own garden. Like you're not you're not having conversations with Jesus in private that people you know what I mean that no one can see. You're not actually in the word daily letting it walk over you. You don't fast. You don't and I'm not saying do those things and that does it either. Jesus is after breaking up our follow ground so that he can bring righteousness within us. And I feel a challenge and a call to some of you today. I don't know who, I don't have a word of the way. I, just, I was back there and it was thundering through me. And I remembered my buddy's word he gave me two days ago. I'm not talking about this. I don't want you to hear this as a rebuke. I want you to hear this as an invitation to say, okay, now, now here's the thing. If you are in this room right now and you're not at some level being sure to respond, then by definition, your, your revelation faith. You're like, I'm God. No, my God is good. I need another. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? No, no, no. Here's the thing, though. What am I not saying? I think you should have a fruitful, fiery life in God. I think you should be a victorious Christian. I think you should not need to, you know, constantly be, because I got all these issues. You do. <laughs> you do have all these issues. <laughs> And the Lord is kind to only show you so many at any time. Anyone who's walked with the Lord for more than 10 years knows, like, when you first got saved, it was like, you mm, can't sleep with your girlfriend anymore, and you got to quit smoking weed. That's all. It's the only thing that mattered then, you know? <laughs> but then once you get faithful with that, it's like three years into it, he's like, hey, um, I was just on And he asked you, baby, to Oh, I like and the Lord's like dealing with you for all two years on how you lie all the time, you know. And then you overcome that one, and for the rest of your life, He's putting His finger on your stuff. So I don't want everyone to be like you guys all saw. You need to come up with your prayer. What I'm saying is, is the Lord, the Lord. I feel this so strongly, though. It is, and, and it's interesting that I'm in a kind of an Iowa a farming, you know, communities. You guys would understand. You know what followed now. Now, in the healthy sense, you have followed on for a reason. It's not too simple. But what can happen in our spiritual life is our our our, our ground just lays fallow. And I think the Lord wants to break up the follow ground today. And so here's, here's what we're gonna do. I know Josh is gonna come up and kind of like transition our service. Damn, I don't like you calling you Josh. Um, I think I think it's Josh. I, well, I think it's because my buddy Josh Curtis gave me this word two days ago, and I keep thinking of Josh Gillespie, your brother. So I got, and I'm Josh. We've got Josh is flowing. So Dan's going to come on up here and kind of like transition us, and we're going to take up an offering of some sort. And then I want us to linger for a moment, and I want us to respond. And just right now, even in the posture of you know offering whatever, just begin to think about some of the stuff that was said this morning. Because I do believe the Lord has a has a real fresh baptism of the Holy Spirit for us today. 
I don't believe that in the Holy Spirit for one time ago. I believe it's in that to that thing theologically to the Bible, that they were being filled with the Holy Spirit in different settings. But I want, I'm asking the Lord to visit us this morning and to shake us out of some of our just, okay, you're right. Like, I need to, you know, like, you've just gotten a little bit maybe complacent. You've gotten just a little bit dull. You've just been going through the motions, and your heart is not connected, maybe like it was in a past. You know, what's the thing you do going, I don't have to even know what that means. I just heard some of the scriptures, bro. You know, we want, well, regardless, we want to pray for you today. So, Dan, come on up. And I'm going I'm to stop there. Um, and then, hey, I didn't go too bad. What time do you guys know me to Okay. It's 11, sorry. Well, Josh, that was an amazing word. That was like drinking from a fire hydrant. All I have to say is what he said. Really good. I want to bless Josh this morning by taking up an offering for him. So um, what we're going to do is if you want to give to Josh and his ministry and what he's doing there in Kansas City, um, I would ask that you um, bring your offering up front, put it in the plate here. Um, if you're writing out a check, make it to Mission Community Church, and we will write him one check. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just uh, thank you for what you're saying to us this morning as a congregation. Lord, we thank you for um, just coming in and working in our hearts, Lord. That producing righteousness in this season, that produce something greater. And let this word that we receive this morning go deep into our hearts and produce change in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah.